we're going to be doing a deep dive into Mary Kay Letourneau. You may have heard of this because this was broadcast everywhere in the 90s. This story was huge. That was when a 34-year-old woman began a relationship with a 12 year old boy that was her sixth grade student welcome to 2024 i wanted to let all of you know that there are lots of positive and exciting changes that are happening on my channel including brand new members content with a lot of extra videos from me including a podcast where the first episode drops today if you'd like to join and become a member or you can join my patreon the links will be in my description down below but here is your preview of the very first episode of unhinged you know i guess sometimes we go through hard things and learn lessons from them. I just don't know what lesson I needed to learn. I just know that it really hurts. This is one of those things that I feel like I can't just keep in and then just be okay at the end of the day. Like, I feel like I have to talk about it. I'm doing this video because there has been a movie that was recently released on Netflix called May December, and it was loosely based off of the story of Mary Kay Letourneau. Now, I'm saying loosely because I did not like this movie. I know a lot about the story and the situation that happened. When I watched this movie, I just was not a fan of it. There were some parts in it that I thought were really good, but overall, I did not like this movie. Did you see it? If you did, let me know what you thought in the comments down below. I feel like there's some very interesting things to talk about when it comes to this teacher and her student and him. In order to fully understand the story, we have to go all the way back to the very beginning. Mary Kay Letourneau was born Mary Catherine on January 30th in 1962 in Tustin, California to her parents, John and Mary. Now, Mary's dad was a Republican politician, a California state senator, and a U.S. representative. Uh, and there's no doubt about it, we're in this thing to win. Now, I'll grant you this, and I don't want this misinterpreted. I recognize realistically that we do not have the inside track. But I'll tell you this, we are a spark now but the spark is falling on dry leaf. Her mom was a former chemist. She was quite articulate, and I thought very bright, and extremely right-wing. She was against incorporating into the law as a constitutional amendment, equal rights for women. Mary was the fourth of seven children and they were raised in a very strict Catholic environment. In an interview in more recent years before her passing, she talked rather positively about her upbringing in the Catholic Church. My father was married once. <laughs> so, oh, where are we going? <laughs> and tell, tell me a bit about your father. Um, I have a mother, my mother is, my father's, passed away and I have six siblings. Was it a was it a Catholic upbringing for you Mary? Yes. For me, it's just a beautiful heritage. That's how I do think of it. I know you're asking what was that like like as if as if there's some uniqueness to being raised Catholic. But I guess I'm just taking present. How does it feel to have been raised Catholic? I just um, both of my parents are from a Catholic family and back and back and back and back. So that's why I say a heritage. Uh, when I go into a Catholic church, it just feels really good. It's like a, it's like this flooding of my heritage. Now, tragedy would hit their family one day when Mary and her siblings were swimming in their family pool. And this is when her three-year-old little brother drowned. And unfortunately, he passed away. This would obviously be a very dark time for their family and something that must have lingered on in their hearts forever. There's nothing more difficult than having a sibling or a child and then losing them, especially so young at only three years old. But the family had to move on even if it was something that they still struggled with mentally they had to move on in their lives later mary attended an all-girls school that was called cornelia Connolly high school and this was located in anaheim california and here she was a member of the cheerleading squad now behind the scenes while mary was in high school her father was also a teacher at santa Ana college during this time he was having an extramarital affair with one of the students at santa Ana college 
witch named Carla Stuckel, and he got her pregnant, not once, but twice, and he secretly fathered her children. It would go on for almost a decade before his second secret life was revealed in 1982. Now, you may be wondering how this secret came to the surface, and it's actually very interesting and upsetting. Carla had taken their infant son to the hospital for an injury where he had gotten a hair wrapped around his and she was even questioned by one of her friends at the time, how did you not see this was there? Were you not bathing him? So when she took him to the hospital, she was actually charged with child abuse. And this charge required her by law to state who the father of the infant was. He didn't try to lie or hide from it. He admitted to being the father, thus ending his political career and labeling him as a hypocrite and a liar. This is important to the story because Mary and John had a very good relationship. She loved her dad. She absolutely adored him. She spoke fondly of her memories with him sitting on the couch together while he read his books and smoked his cigars. And perhaps she was inspired to get into teaching because he was also a teacher. But Mary will tell you later on in an interview that it was because she was an a at teaching and a B at music, which was her first career choice. I realized that, um, you know what, I'm a B in music and dance. I'm a B, good. That's good, nothing wrong with a B. And, but I was an A at teaching and everybody recognized. But in the end, she took the path of teaching. Now, before we talk about Mary's career in teaching and when all of this started, we need to talk about when she got married to her first husband. This was a man by the name of Steve Letourneau, and he was one of her college sweethearts from Arizona State University, where they were both attending. She would later say that she never felt that she was in love with him, but that she felt pressured to marry him by her parents, and maybe because she was really close with her her father, maybe she really respected his opinion, and if he liked him, then she must marry him. Mary's best friend at the time recalled when she met Steve for the first time, and she said that the second that he was out of ear's reach of the two of them, that she questioned Mary's interest in him. She didn't think the two looked like they went together. She thought Mary was above him, and she was confused why they were even together. To the beach that day, and he had a friend of his with him. I don't know, I guess he, had, he and his friend had gone off in the water to go swimming and I just turned around and looked at her and I went, what are you doing with him? This did not stop Mary and they got married and moved to Alaska. They would end up having four children and their marriage was a mess to say the least. Her neighbor and later would-be attorney David Gerke said that Mary was emotionally and physically abused by her husband during their marriage. And on two instances during this abuse, she had gone to the hospital twice where police were called during these alleged instances but no charges would be filed. So with all that being said, it's very clear that Mary suffered some hardships in her life. Her three-year-old brother drowning in the pool while she was in it with him had to be something that lingered in her mind and in her heart for her entire life. That's not something that you can just get over. That's something that will change your life because it's such a tragedy. And then her father, who she adored and loved, had a secret relationship that she knew nothing about with one of his students, fathering two two half siblings of hers that she never knew about. And then she gets married to a man that she doesn't really love and it's allegedly an abusive marriage. But the path that Mary was about to take would leave no room for anyone to have any sympathy for her any longer. It all began when she was teaching a second grade class. One of her students was an eight-year-old boy by the name of Vili Fulau. Vili was born on June 26, 1983 in Buren, Washington to his parents, Lueva and Suna, both Samoan immigrants. Now, Mary Kay would allege that she formed a close relationship with Vili, but that it wasn't an inappropriate one at the time. She stated Vili had a remarkable artistic ability and she wasn't quite sure what her feelings at the time meant, but perhaps it may be 
one day he would marry her daughter. Now, when you've watched a lot of interviews with Villy and Mary, it gets really confusing because watching the two of them together, you question basically everything they say. In my personal opinion, it doesn't seem like we have ever gotten the truth fully on when things started. I think that they had an agreement to keep certain details private. I think they told us as much as they felt they had to and left the rest out. So with a lot of these things that I'm saying, it's just kind of, you have to take it with a grain of salt because it's hard to know what's the truth and what isn't the truth because the only facts we have are very little. So over the next several years, Mary would keep in touch with Billy by bringing him art supplies, taking him to museums, and alleging that she was encouraging him to develop his talent for poetry. Coincidentally, Billy would become Mary's student again in the sixth grade. He was now 12 years old and Mary was 34. This was where they alleged that their feelings for each other deepened and that things went further. I had separated emotionally from the marriage um, quite a time, quite a bit of time before, uh, before I felt, uh, before I recognized my relationship with that particular student. In their 1998 book, Billy alleged that when he was 12 years old, him and a friend made a bet for $20 that he could sleep with Mary. And then they would later tell another story where he was hiding in a closet with a friend, perhaps the same one he made this bet with, and that while they were hiding in there, they would try and look up Mary's skirt every time she would walk by. When they tell the story in the interview, Billy seems very uncomfortable and he says that he doesn't want to tell the story, but Mary proceeds to tell it and she also also laughs about it. Seems taken aback by the fact that a 12 year old would do such a thing, which is funny considering that she never felt what she did was wrong. He's I have like, not really like good memories, but some of them are just random, just pretty much random stuff. In the closet, there's a closet in the, <laughs> oh, no. in the classroom. And then me and my friends, we used to be in there hiding in the classroom. From Mary? Why don't you say what you were doing hiding in the You're closet? Just hiding in the closet. No, what did you tell me you were doing? Well, that's, not, that's weird to talk about right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is what, oh, what you said to me is like, yeah, we'd hide in the closet and we'd hope you'd walk past so we could look under your skirt. I'm like, what the heck? I mean, who's like, tell us like years later. Uh, is that what you told, it is what you told me. Mm-hmm. So like you feel better? <laughs> what does he remember? That's what he told me he remembered. I'm like, wow. Yeah, right. Wow, I had no idea. So Billy would continue to spend time with the Laternos and even become friends with Steve and Mary's son, which is extremely weird and almost came off like it was an excuse for him to have sleepovers at their house. They had many sleepovers. They claim that nothing ever took place whenever he was over there, which is extremely hard to believe. So during one of these sleepovers was when they got caught for the first time. Mary and Billy ended up leaving the house and wound up in a car together, alone. It was June 18th, 1996, when police found the two of them in a parked car at a marina. The police officer saw Mary jump into the front of the seat, and Mary had allegedly told Billy to pretend to sleep in the back. When they were asked for identification, they both lied. They told the police that he was 18, and that Mary was a family friend he was staying with, and that no touching had taken place. Mary stated that her and her husband had gotten to an argument that night, and that Billy had witnessed it so the two of them left to try and find him. Now the cop obviously had questions because he took the both of them into the police station where he had Billy contact his mom. So he clearly didn't believe that he was 18 years old or he wouldn't be like, you need to go call your mommy. You know what I mean? Now his mom asked the cop to bring him home and he did and then nothing was done about this incident. Now in the future, the couple alleges that nothing happened during the car incident, but people still question to this day the legitimacy of when and for how long they had been doing this. They claim that the first time that they had sex was on top of the roof of their house. We just had this hugging and kiss, kissing relationship going on. All that mattered was that we loved each other. 
Mary wasn't exactly being careful with her feelings either. She was putting them in journals, and her husband Steve would end up finding these journals and reading them. And in the journals, she detailed her feelings towards Billy. She even wrote letters to him and talked about their love. So Mary's husband went to confront Billy about the journals and letters that he found. I told him that uh, Mrs. Letourneau was in great trouble. He was also. I wanted to know one thing. I said I had found journals. I know everything. He was filled betrayed, big time, betrayed. We had created this family together. We made commitments thick or thin. I didn't believe at all that she would cross a certain line of no return. So Mary got away with it for now, and it would be the following year in 1997. She would be arrested after a relative of Steve's called the officials at Shorewood Elementary where she was teaching. The anonymous caller said that there was a teacher who not only had an inappropriate relationship with a student, but that she was also six months pregnant with his child. She was arrested on March 4th of 1997 and would plead guilty to two counts of second degree a child. She had to plead guilty and she'd go to prison or she'd go into treatment. She is an adult who used a boy, a sixth grade child. She committed a crime, a serious crime. And this is a very complicated case psychiatrically as well as just in terms of the number of events uh, involved in it. I concluded that she was suffering from severe bipolar disorder, meaning both mania and depression. Your Honor, I did something that I had no right to do, morally or legally. It was wrong, and I am sorry. I give you my word that it will not happen again. Please, please help me. Help us, help us all. It was absolutely sincere, absolutely mistaken uh, by most people, including me. She hadn't done wrong by sleeping with Billy. The wrong was adultery. Mary gave birth to a daughter that she shared with Billy on May 29th while awaiting her sentencing, where the state was going for six and a half years in prison. Exposing them, you know, this whole private situation hurt a lot of people. It hurt my school, the teachers that I worked with, it hurt my students. And without saying, of course, it hurt my family, my children. I was very sincere in asking for forgiveness. This has been an extremely difficult case in many, many respects. I am satisfied that the defendant is amenable to community-based treatment. Although reasonable professional minds do differ, I am persuaded overall by the experts' opinions. Whether you stay out of prison is completely within your hands. However, fortunately for Mary, she garnered enough sympathy from the judge to only serve six months in county jail and three years of sex offender treatment. At this time, she was not required to register as sex offender, and part of her plea agreement was that she could not contact Villy, her children, or have any contact with minors. I was told by the counselor that was in charge in a little booth at the jail with a piece of glass between us that I would not have any contact with my children. When you got out? From the time I got out, for a minimum of six months, no contact with my children, not a birthday card, not a present, not a phone call, no contact. You had not been told that before? Oh, no. At that very moment, I decided that I will go to prison so that I can pick up the phone and say I love you to my children. 
When Billy was still underage, he did an interview, a very old interview, where his identity was being hidden. And in this interview, he talked about his love for Mary. He talked about the child that they shared together, his feelings on her sentencing, and he also said that he did not feel as though he was a victim. I feel it is very important to remember, though, that the person that is speaking in this interview is a 14-year-old boy that is the father of his first child with a woman that is 34 years old. Were you happy with Mary Kay's sentence? Um, happy, relieved, wanted to cry, but couldn't. I love her. I love her with all my heart. And there'll never ever be another person like her. She was just an innocent person, not looking around for boys to have sex with she was really looking for was just looking for love and, and she just found love in the wrong place. Audrey is my little angel, a princess. I love her a lot. But even now, the victim in this case says he doesn't feel like a victim. He still wears a ring Mary Kay gave him and says their affair was never about age. You don't feel that you were raped? No. Rape is a whole different thing from what she did, what we did. I would take my love for Mary and I'd keep her love within my heart and just lock it up. Just two weeks after completing her jail sentence, she was found by police in a car again with Billy near her home. They also provided false identification, just like they did the first time, and lied to the police officers. Then there was evidence that the two had met up numerous times prior to this and she was arrested. This is kind of what I mean when I'm saying that. I don't believe that we will ever fully know exactly what happened when because it seems that they claimed the first time for anything was always the time they got caught. And I find that to be interesting. The judge revoked Mary's plea agreement and reinstated the the original prison sentence of seven and a half years for violating her no contact order. Less than three months ago, you were given the opportunity, Ms. Letourneau, for treatment. Within weeks of your release from jail, purposely violated the conditions of your sentence. These violations are extraordinarily egregious and profoundly disturbing. This case is not about a flawed system. It is about an opportunity that you foolishly squandered. The suspended sentence is hereby revoked and the original sentence that I imposed not long ago of 89 months is imposed. She was sent to Washington Correctional Center for Women and she was in a small cell where she ate all of her meals alone. She's been confined to a cramped cell like this one 23 hours a day. She doesn't have contact with uh, other inmates at all. She has all of her meals uh, in her cell. She talked about how she was getting letters from the community supporting her and how she hoped that her children were giving the gift of love to their father. Today I am still in great pain. Pain for my children's loss being apart from me. My one hope is that this will be a time for my children to give their gift of love to their father. I am trying to make the best use of my time here. I get letters from the community that really help. There's been an, actually a global outreach. And in a shocking turn of events, Mary was pregnant again with Villy's second child. So she would give birth in prison and during her seven and a half years, it was alleged that she was very unpopular with the other inmates. She would sass guards and reportedly spent 18 of her first 24 months in solitary confinement. She served six of those months for letters that she was trying to send to Villy from prison. I do know that you'll love me forever. I'm afraid to love you as much as I do because I know you need to love someone in a different way, in a way that we can't have. All of this love you have for me, you get to give it to someone someday. If there wasn't such a thing as family loyalty, tradition, peer pressure and laws, we'd have a perfect love. Maybe it's too powerful for this world. Never say goodbye, forever, love. The baby will happen. I'm confused about when. Anything else is so far from possible. I know you want to get married someday. And maybe you need to be able to have a wedding, a beautiful bride, a great celebration. But the thing that was interesting about this was that in some of the phone calls and letters that Mary was trying to get to Billy, she was telling him that if he married her, that she would probably get a shorter sentence and be able to be released sooner. If Billy 
formally asked me to marry him. Now, of course, I would say. Know that Mary has been disciplined, sent to solitary uh, for probably almost nine months total for continued contact with Billy, either by phone or by mail um, or what have you. What was the purpose for which she was contacting you? She said that she had a lot of people helping her in and out of prison. And she said all she needs is my hand in, her, in marriage or, or our marriage. And that if you uh, were to get married to her, that she would be able to get out of prison sooner? Yeah. Even if we do get married while I'm still here at the prison, I know that we plan to have a more sacred ceremony with our family and our friends. After that, we're going to provide for our children. And I have six, so that's a lot of providing for. It is so unbelievably inappropriate and creepy to be speaking to an underage child about marriage, to be telling them, you need to marry me, give your life to me so that I can get out of prison. There was no regard for Villy in this at all. But then when she speaks about Villy in later interviews once she was released, she says things like she felt that Villy needed her. It was wrong. The extramarital part was very wrong. It's hard to look back at the whole the progress of the relationship and pinpoint a time where I could have made a different decision. In my heart and in my mind, he wasn't an age. I think when we have close relationships with people, we value the relationship for completely outside of what's, what someone's age is. I felt that I very much needed the relationship. I also felt that he needed the relationship. There's no empathy to what she robbed Vili of at all, which was his entire childhood. Vili's mother was given custody of Vili and Mary Kay's two children, and when she spoke, she had a lot of sympathy for Mary. Mary's not a bad person. She's just a human being that made a terrible mistake. Seeing Mary that day and her crying and crying out for help, I believe her. I mean, what, what, what does she have to lose? She's lost everything else. Do you consider Mary Kay a member of your family? I would say she is. She is, after all, the mother of my granddaughter. Knowing that she has the care that she has through her biological family has helped me quite a bit. Now, you're probably wondering, what was going on with Villy when all of this was happening? Um, for sure, I'm going to get back with her. If I ever see her again, we're going to have a lot of talking to do before her. Anything else. He struggled with his mental health. Sometimes I feel like I should have never gotten close with her. So he's an underage father of two. His mother was granted custody of his two daughters and he dropped out of high school. He suffered from depression, alcoholism, and even attempted suicide in March of 1999. His family would later sue Highline School District, the city of Des Moines, Washington, for emotional suffering, lost wages, and costs of rearing his two children. They claimed that the school and the police department had failed to protect him from Mary. But unfortunately, after a 10-week trial, there were no damages rewarded. And during his deposition, we got some more details into what happened with his relationship with Mary, and the details were incredibly disturbing. Now, in future interviews, they never talked about these things. Billy would later come out and say that he lied, which doesn't make any sense why he would get up there and lie about this. Mary has always tried to come off like Billy was the aggressor and that she didn't do anything. She was just this woman that was just overtaken by this 12 year old boy. But when you hear this deposition, that doesn't sound like the truth. Did you have a crush on Mrs. Letourneau when you were 12? 
Yes. Did you think she was pretty? I thought she was hot. One time, she uh, said she would strip for me for every answer I got right. I asked her if, what would she do if I was to go over and kiss her? She said only a cow would, would wait, something like that, and a warrior would just go ahead and do it. I just said, what the hell, and went over and kissed her. Describe the type of kissing the two of you were doing. French kissing. Open mouths? Open mouth, tongue to tongue. She was sitting down like this, and I got on top of her, and I was, I had my hand on her head, and I was feeling on her breast. I asked her if she would marry me. Did you give her anything? I gave her a ring. What happened when you gave the ring to Mrs. Letourneau? She took her husband's ring off and put mine on. So Mary served her time and was released from prison in August of 2004 and immediately went to register as a lifetime level two sex offender. When she was released, Billy was now 21 years old, a legal adult, and he managed to reverse the no contact order against Mary. So the two of them could legally be around each other. And not only that, the two of them got married the following year, May 20th. In a future interview with an Australian news reporter, Mary is asked about the first time that she knew of Villy. This is when we hear that he was actually younger when she first met him than we first thought. When did you first meet Villy? Uh, meet? Uh, the first time I was familiar with the name Villy Fulao, 1980, nine, uh, 1989, 88, uh, not sure. Was that when you were here, his year two teacher? He was one of my students back then. I hardly remember. Of course, I remember his name. So, and I knew the Fulao family before, and then here came um, a unique one. Villy was born on June 26th in 1983, which makes him 40 years old today. If she met him in 1988, like she says in this interview, that means Mary Kay Letourneau met Villy when he was five years old. Mary has always said that this 12-year-old little boy pursued her and that he was the aggressor. You were the adult. You can say that. I was by age. I was by age. And by Just maturity. Ah, uh, you maybe. Do but I? you don't know him. No, but I don't need to know him in this discussion. He's the child. Who I'm the talking boss? about you. Who was the boss? Oh, what was the name? Who was the boss? What? Who was the boss back then? You know, then? there was me pursuing you. Who was the boss back then? <laughs> this is ridiculous. No, this who is was? Ridiculous. Who was? Just say. Who was the boss? All I knew was what I knew back then. But who was the boss? He was 13, Mary. But who was the boss? This is getting weird. Who was the boss? Who? I'm pursuing the relationship. Who was the boss? Well, I was the pursuer. Yes. Mary, even as you're but, hearing this now, come on, he was 13. It doesn't matter. Oh, well, flaw me. If sexual intercourse happened, no matter if it was, no matter if he was the aggressor, no matter if he initiated it, I am the adult, sexual intercourse happened. In our state, there are three elements. Sexual intercourse ap happened, the age difference, and third element, we were not married. What does that say right there? And we were not married. That means if we had been, in theory, if we had been married, no crime. I'm just saying. She acts as though she doesn't bear responsibility and what happened and that she didn't do anything wrong. She also goes on to say that she was not a pedophile because he was not prepubescent. Isn't this just a physical relationship between a woman and a man, or I should say at that point, a little boy? Well, you shouldn't say a little boy. He was 13. Because I know, but you shouldn't say a little boy. Well, a teenage so, boy. Well, you know, some people are incarcerated in this state at age 13, and they're treated as an adult, and they're not called little boys because he wasn't 
prepubescent, he wasn't a child. You say he wasn't a child, he was 13. Wow. If the two 13-year-old teenagers are having sex, do you want to say there's two children having sex? Is that what you would say? Sure, but then I'd say it's infinitely worse if that 13-year-old has sex with Fine. an adult it woman. it is true. And when she's questioned on why would you plead guilty then to two counts of second-degree rape of a child if you don't believe that you did anything wrong, she says that she did it because she felt that it would be easier for everyone. Did you do anything wrong? I did at one point say, say, you have to go. I did. I cried harder than, um, and I didn't know I was pregnant, but I did say, you have to go. Do you understand? You have to go. Your answer would be yes or no? I'm going to be the same as you. I would not take back anything. I'm going to say the same as you. I'm not going to continue with you trying to have me answer that question. I told you I did my best every single day, and I lived my life that way, and I did. That situation, it doesn't even matter. Do you think you were wrongly, wrongly imprisoned? Absolutely. Why? Because you don't know our story, but we do. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, a rela relationships like that are okay. They're not. Um, I would say um, in our situation and me, what happened between us, you know, shouldn't have been anybody's business. 12 years after they got married, Villy filed for separation from Mary, but ended up withdrawing the filing. It happened again in August of 2019 when the couple both filed for separation, and this time they did split. Villy moved out, but Mary ended up calling him on the phone one day to tell him that she had cancer. This is when he flew back to be with her and stayed by her side until the day that she died on July 6th, 2020. People, when they think of her and her legacy, they think of how strong she was and how brilliant she was and how kind she was and not look at her as a child rapist. That was, we all make mistakes and uh, she overcame hers and did a lot of good in the world both before and after. She texted and told me that she was uh, feeling a bit sick and that um, she wasn't sure what it was and she told me some of her symptoms. They found that she had cancer and that it had already spread to her liver. So I got, a, I, got a, I got on the plane, you know, right away, and I went out there, and she believed that a miracle was gonna happen. When we had first met, you know, I was a lot younger, and, and she was, you know, she was ripped out of my life at that time. And, and so, you know, this time, it's, you know, there's no, there's not gonna be another letter, and there's not gonna be a phone call. The last day, um, sorry, I'm not trying to. It's okay. I was there with uh, our youngest daughter and her youngest daughter from her previous marriage. She was talking about when they were kids and we were laughing and I, well, I didn't see her chest moving. I told the kids that they need to call the rest of the siblings to come and say their goodbyes, that this is, this is it. Mary never took responsibility or accountability for what she did. She never said she felt sorry that she had done anything wrong. And anytime she was asked a question about her involvement as a 34 year old woman with a 12 year old boy, she would avoid any statement that would make her sound like a pedophile. She would argue against it and say that she wasn't going to disrespect her marriage by saying that she had done anything wrong. There was a lot of delusion with Mary. When you watch her in these interviews, when she's asked how she would feel if it was reversed and a man had done that, she would say she's not in agreement with that. She was also a very strict mother and didn't allow her teenage daughters to date at all, not even someone their own age. Very strict, very strict. <laughs> um, she's a very good mom, very, couldn't be more happier to have her as a mother of my children. How could you ever tell, you know, a young girl that's in middle school and just starting high school, you cannot have a boyfriend, eh? The reason for me telling you <clears> that <throat> was um, just from out of experience, you know, just living life. And when you're that young, a relationship, you know, could lead to something that you think you wanted back then, you don't really want it maybe years later. And so don't ever get too serious about it. Don't put your all into something when you know it's just temporary. If one of your daughters came to you and said, I'm sleeping with my teacher, what would you say? 
What? What? Yeah, okay. It would be, I think it would be the same reaction that um, any parent would have, you know, if their child came up and said, you know, I'm in, I'm in love with my teacher. What about if they said they were sleeping with anyone? We mm -hmm. would say the same thing. <laughs> so. I mean, was, yeah, it would just in that general, you know, I'm sleeping with someone, I'm in love with someone. I still, you know, even if it's just a boy, you know, of their own age. I'm what still, would you say? I don't know really how to deal with it. There wouldn't be something going on behind my back that I wasn't aware of with my children that I would be shocked. But I don't support um, younger kids, you know, being married or having a relationship with someone older. I don't support. During the interviews we saw Avili and Mary, their relationship seemed strained and tense. It never stopped feeling like the two of them continued on with the dishonest story of how what happened happened. So we may never know the truth about when it began and we never heard Mary admit wrongdoing. Back then, 34 and 13, did you have a sense that what you were doing wasn't right? Uh, you must have known such a smart woman that this something wasn't right about what was going on. Well, just know that there wasn't any, any thought or any idea that something was going to happen. So no, there wasn't a thought about, there wasn't a thought about. Did you have any philosophical problems, moral problems, with entertaining the idea of a relationship with a 13-year-old boy? Well, I wasn't entertaining the idea, and that's my point. But, so, but you clearly were. Uh, eventually. What I thought is he doesn't understand that I have four children and I have responsibilities. No, and there, there were eliminated. laws. There were laws, Mary. Oh, the there, law no, was no, no, there statutory rape. For males. And if you look historically, it was a male only. And then the laws changed when the, when equality, let's go mad on this. You want to? When I grew up, sure, as a teenager, I knew that, oh, if that male, um, the males knew, because it was a well-known thing, because of because a lot of dads out there were saying, stay away from, stay away from the daughters here in this house, because I'll get a shotgun out, because you're older, and I can charge, I can go to the police, and it would be called statutory rape. Some people wonder if perhaps she purposefully got pregnant and later married Villy just to prove to the public that, that she was not a pedophile, and that she truly loved him, and that it was all for show. This, to me, seems like it could be a very real possibility because she did marry her first husband saying she was never in love with him and was married to him for a long time and had four children with him. It seems like it wouldn't be that hard for her to remain in a marriage with someone that she didn't love. In interviews, you can see sadness in Billy's eyes, you can also see that Mary still had control over him, but we only know what we know and we'll never know more than that unless Villy decides to speak out now that she's gone. But Suffering inside. How dark was it for you? I would say it was pretty dark. There's only in a really deep depression. And I'm not, I'm not trying to play the victim here about any of it. I just think that there's a lot of things that could have happened, but they didn't. There's a lot of help that uh, we both could have gotten that didn't happen. Where we are today, was it right? Was it wrong? Um, I don't know. Um, happened, and everything that did happen that we do speak of that we felt within our hearts for each other was real. But in the legal system and for the average normal eye, you know, it is obviously wrong for many reasons. All I was thinking about through that entire time was um, how she was doing and was she okay. I never really thought about myself. I was more uh, worried about what she was going to be doing. This situation is such an interesting one and so unique because it ends where the two of them get married and they have children together and they go on to remain married until 2019 when Villy left Mary Kay Letourneau. But even when he left her and moved away, when she contacted him after she got diagnosed with cancer, he flew back to be with her and stayed at her side until the day that she died. And then in the interview that he had with Dr. Oz, you can tell that he genuinely loved her. You can see it in his face and that he felt emotion and care for her. And still to this day, you know, he hasn't really come out and said anything very damning against her. And I think this is really interesting. My personal opinion on it is that whenever he got older, I do believe that he was able to recognize 
what what she did wrong. But I think that it's one of those situations where he was groomed and he was groomed at a very young age and he grew up essentially with his groomer who was already an established adult who already lived her life. She had a family with children. She had a husband. He was just a kid. She knew better and he didn't. And even still, as he, you know, entered adulthood and this marriage with her after she served time, whenever he would ever try to express how he felt about it, she would always put blame on him and say that he was the aggressor. He was the one that pursued her. She never took responsibility for anything. You could tell that she truly believed she didn't do anything wrong. And that's where it is so sick and twisted because he was just a child who had his entire life ahead of him that she robbed from him. And I'm sure, you know, he loves his children and wouldn't imagine a world without them. I'm sure he did love and care for Mary. And, you know, I believe his his feelings were genuine for him, but he only knows what he knows, you know? Like he doesn't know a life without her where this didn't happen. Even in that interview where they were discussing this entire situation and he was asked how he would feel if his daughter said that they were in a relationship with the teacher, he wouldn't be okay with it. He didn't even want them to date even someone their age. I feel like he knew that it was wrong but he was so wrapped up in it. You could see the control that Mary had over him in these interviews. She was a very unwell woman and I feel bad for him. You know, he had struggles with his family growing up and was forced to grow up very young. And it's really sad to see the situation where he got wrapped up with an adult that took advantage of him and took advantage of the struggles that he had. And I think it, it should be called what it is. Mary Kay Letourneau was a pedophile and she assaulted and raped him. This was not a sexual relationship. I don't care if they ended up married or not. She took advantage of this little boy. She manipulated him and she groomed him. Just like in other situations where the man is in his 30s and has groomed a, a child. I feel like this situation, even though she did serve time and, and she was attacked in the media for it and everything as she should have been, I do feel like there were a whole bunch of people that just, that just didn't call this what it was because she was a pretty white woman. Because if she was a man and it was a 12-year-old little girl, it would have been treated so differently. The situation is so sad and I don't feel like he received justice in the way that he deserved. Even in the interviews, there was one in particular, which I'm sure I showed in this video, where the interviewer asked him, what attracted you to Mary, right? But they never asked her what attracted her to him. Those were the questions I wanted to know. Why were you attracted to this 12 year old child? Why did you pursue this 12-year-old child? Like, ask her the hard questions and make her uncomfortable. But in numerous interviews that I've seen, it was all guided at him. Like, why did you do this? He was 12 years old. Seeing people ask him these questions was honestly enraging to me. I hope that he's able to live a fulfilled life now that she is out of the picture and, you know, able to see things a little bit more clearly. The situation is so sad and... Too often things like this happen that we don't even hear about. You guys are gonna have to let me know what your thoughts are down below about this. And if you liked this style of video that I've done, make sure to give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment and let me know and I will definitely do more of them like this. Thank you so much for watching and I'll be seeing you soon for another video.